And we're live. <laughs> it is amazing the difference power makes. Hallelujah. Well, now, <laughs> with much ado about nothing <laughs> so far, welcome to Expedition Church of the Triad. <coughs> I'm glad to have you tonight. Hope you're having an awesome week. And let's go ahead and jump in um, by turning in our Bibles to Philippians, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 4, uh, reading verses 11 through 13, and we will uh, be reading out of the Amplified Bible for this passage. Did I hear a, a cheer? <laughs> <clears throat> Paul writing here to the church at Philippi states, not that I am implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted. In what so whatever state I am, I know how to be abased and live hum humbly in straightened circumstance. I know also how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned in any and all circumstances the secret of facing every situation, whether well fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and enough to spare. Or going without and being in want. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. <clears throat> I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Now, obviously, that's not King Jimmy. That is, that is the Amplified. It is Amplified Classic now. You can't even call it the Amplified because they, they took the Amplified and turned it into just a, like the RSV or something. Okay. Um, Paul stating here, and when we, uh, we kind of look at this passage, you know, Paul is, um, when you, when you kind of get into his head, <coughs> in his mind, um, All right, here we go. Paul had been talking about in this chapter um, about them taking care of his needs, um, supporting him, um, talk about how the church at Philippi had reconnected um, with giving and supporting his ministry. And... Um, and he said that, you know, in verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly and that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, uh, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. In other words, they wanted to, there was not, there was not an opportunity. Mm -hmm. When opportunity presented itself, they did. He was, he was thanking them for that. But then he came back and said, now, not that I speak in respect to one. In other words, his point is not that um, <clears throat> I was like, put the pressure on or, you know, trying to get you to, you know, give up the money so that, you know, whatever. And let's, let's, let's be balanced about this. There, there is a place for raising funds to do certain projects. Okay. I understand that. Um, however, sometimes we got ministries just raise the money so they can have a bigger ministry. Okay. And, uh, I think that, that turns people off. Well, it turns me off. Okay. Um, it's not, it's not so that preachers can just all be, you know, all the big guys because they have all the big stuff and be cool, you know, while they preach cool stuff. But Paul said, look, I've learned. I've learned. I've learned how to have too much. I've, and, 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 you know, and, and I've heard, learned how to have enough. Okay. And I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. Okay. So. Uh, I remember the day of raising money for TV, you know, uh, your, your, either your radio stations or your TV. If you don't give this week, we're going off the air. <clears throat> Why am I sending money? If you're going off the air. All right. We got to, we got to have, you know, you know, we got to have 200 new partners this week or we're going off the air. Well, what if you only get 180 and I sent money? It's not going to get spent. You're going off the air. Okay. Um, 20th century New Testament, which has been out of, oh, good gracious, it's been out of print for 100 years. 
Um, do not think that I'm saying this under pressure of want, okay? For I, have, for, for I, however I am placed, have learned to be independent of the circumstances. And I think this, this sums it up the best. Paul's stating that he's learned that circumstances can't govern him. See, the life of faith is you don't let the circumstances govern you. Amen? Circumstances are not your boss. Isn't that right? Uh, so Paul's stating, you know, look, you guys, uh, I was out here doing all this. Your, your care for me has flourished again. You didn't have the opportunity to give it. Now you are, and I'm, I'm appreciative. But you know what? I was going on and making it anyhow. <clears throat> all right? Um, I, I, get, I get amazed at some people, you know, they, they want to be the one to give money to something and, you know, and get, you know, make sure that everybody knows that they're the one that gave the big amount. Okay? You know, and everybody can pat them on the back and tell them how great they are, that they, they're the one that helped make this campaign take place and all this kind of stuff. Um, that we get into those things, we get into the heart issues there. Okay? Where, where is your heart when you're doing what you're doing? Okay? If you're only going to give when it's going to make sure that you are the one uh, noticed about it, then, then don't. Okay? If you're doing it because you have a heart of love for the things of God and you, it's, it's in your heart to do something, then do it. Okay? But, but you know, Paul's saying, I'm not, um, I guess if he's writing to the church today, he'd say, look, I don't owe you guys anything. You don't owe my ministry. You don't control it because you gave the big dollars. We got that happening in church all the time. You know? Well, I want you, I, I mean, I had somebody when we first came to Greensboro. And we took the church back in 19, way on back yonder, <laughs> okay? We took the church, and I'll never forget one of the people at church coming up and saying, my, my tithe pays all for, for all the church bills. <clears throat> Big whoop. Okay? Because that statement is it really, honestly, that kind of statement is just you, 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 make, you need to make sure you, you know, cater to me because if you don't, I'm going to pull the money. And you ain't going to have anything because I pay everything. How many ever saw that movie, uh, Pollyanna, the Disney movie, Pollyanna? You know, but then they did a remake of it back in the 90s called Polly. Okay? And it, it was the African-American version, a hundred times better than the original I mean, it was really good, and um, but her 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 aunt ran the town, and would give the preacher his sermon titles, and meet with him weekly to discuss his delivery. Okay, and she was running the town, and the church, and everything else because she was rich. She got wealthy. She became a wealthy person. She, she, I think she ended up owning the mill and she ran, everybody worked for her and all this. And she, bless God, gonna let the preacher know she's the reason he's got a job. And he, he, she would give him her sermon title suggestions and then tell him which one to preach. Jesus help us. See, that's, that's, that's not why we give in the kingdom of God. Amen. You know, well, my tithe, no, your tithe is, your tithe is 10%. And your tithe is no more than anybody else's in the church. What do you mean? 10% is 10%. It's 10%. And it don't change anything, it's still 10%. Okay? Now, we might look at the bank account, and see, but God sees 10%. Okay? So, you know, stop it with the games. All right. So Paul, Paul kind of, kind of like, in one side, it's making a statement that the, nobody owns the ministry because we obey God. Amen. We all, we we do what God says do, and you can't cater to people because they're, they're, they're at the end of the year their contribution letter is bigger than anybody else's. You can't cater to that, and we don't have that in here. I mean, I'm, I know that. I'm not saying I'm not preaching. I'm not there. <laughs> just just so y'all don't think I'm preaching to anybody. I'm not. Uh, but we've seen it, and we have seen it in the past. You know, 
where we, you know, where there's that we're going to pull the money, you know, and there's strings attached to the money. And, you know, we're going to do this, but, you know, here's what, without saying it, the expectation is this. Well, that's not, that's not right. We're independent of the circumstances. And we, we as a church and me as a pastor have been through not having enough. We've been through having more than enough. That's where we are right now. We're at the best place financially we've ever been in the history of the church. Right now. I mean, never, never has it been this way the whole time we've been here. We have been where it was, you know, snorkel up on an extra uh, cane pole up to get so you could breathe because you're so far underwater. All right. Um, so with that in mind, we have to learn, like Paul did, that even though others weren't supply, supplying his ministry, he was independent of those circumstances. He was trusting God. And so we as believers need to find contentment in life or with life. Amen. Amen. Now, we come along in the past you know, 30 years, there's been a heavy emphasis, um, particularly about 10 years ago back, there was a heavy emphasis on prosperity. Now, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm for biblical prosperity. Okay, and there, there was a season and there, there needed to be an emphasis, but you can take any emphasis and go too far with it, just like faith, just like the baptism of the Holy Ghost, just like grace. People can take those subjects and go too far with them. Well, how do you get too, too far with the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Oh, you just got to have a service where everybody gets a goose bump. If they don't get a goose bump, then you didn't have a move of the Spirit. You know what? You can have a move of the Spirit teaching a Bible lesson. Yeah. If the Holy Spirit is anointing what's going on in there at that moment, and when on, on the on the minister speaking the word <clears throat> and teaching the word, and he's taking that word and, put, and and planting it into your heart as the teacher of the church, that is a move of the Spirit. Yeah. But we think unless we are we got you know we've got the Pentecostal uh, bobby pins flying around the room. <laughs> now I grew up classical Pentecostal. The beehive hairdos, okay, and burlap sacks for dresses because that you could be couldn't be worldly, and you know, and they get to dancing and shouting, doing what we we call the Pentecostal chicken, <laughs> and I, you know, okay, it's it's, it's just as anointed as the Tulsa two step. <laughs> oh, that's the move of the spirit there. We gotta we got the Tulsa two step going on because we're dancing like the Jewish people dance, okay. <laughs> We get so silly sometimes. Amen. But we can take stuff too far. All right. And um, with prosperity, I think we've seen people get to the point that unless they, because they don't have some of the exaggerated promises that were implied, there's a, there's a dissatisfaction in life. Because they were given, the, they were dreaming this, you know, huge Robin Leach visitation to your lifestyle of the rich and famous house, and it didn't happen. And the emphasis got put in places, and so people started losing their contentment. And here, wait, let me take, let me share with you what happens when you lose contentment. <coughs> you start looking for alternative things to fill it. Hello. Mm -hmm. Now we got, you, you look, let's do that little house cleaning in the church. I'm about known for that, am I? Okay, <laughs> all right. We've had probably more prosperity, word of faith type people, big beggar churches in adultery than anybody else. How many of you seen fall? How many of you hear about? It happens all the time. Why? Because the emphasis got placed in a place it didn't belong. It got placed on a subject matter or a vein in a way that it wasn't right. And people lost contentment. They lost satisfaction with life. They became very dependent upon their circumstances. If I don't have the 
power tie of the week. I can't preach. You know? I remember Brother Cope was sharing one time. He said, you know, he's sitting up on the platform with getting ready for the service, and a lady walked by with her husband and stopped him and said, Roy, that's what you need. You need socks just like him. <laughs> yeah, because there's anointing in those socks. <laughs> Back when they were doing the, uh, some of y'all remember, maybe, maybe you remember, the big satellite seminars. Now I'm talking about when you, where everybody bought the big screen projector and the satellite dish from this ministry down in Texas. The big satellite. Okay, and the big projector, they had the three eyeballs on it, you know, with the screen up there and you had to project it from the screen. And it was so dim, you had to turn out every light in the room to watch the thing. So we had one brother, he'd come with his Bible and his notebook. Y'all remember Everybody Lanterns? I mean, you know, I don't know what, what one million candlelight or something. No, not really, but you know, bright. So we're sitting there in the middle of this seminar going on, you know, <clears throat> the monthly from this church. And all of a sudden, the glory lights up the room. No, it's his flashlight on his notes. That big old every ray lantern just light up the whole room. <coughs> well, this pastor, who got in, who got it way out in the era eventually. I mean, you know, make your vow to God, and you had to have a, a thousand dollar vow. And they'd get, and all his television program became was everybody paying their one thousand dollar vow to the ministry. And the testimonies of all the people who got super rich from doing it. That's nothing but a multi-level marketing scheme. If you watch our program and you give to that, you're going to get rich. Hello. He got caught up in some stuff and it, was, it wasn't good. Okay. Why? Because you lost the real contentment of life. Anyway, he would wear a tie one month. And the next month, all the host pastors around the country who had the satellite dishes that were connected to the program had the tie. Because you had to have this, the power tie. It was the power tie of the month. Because that, that tie did it. Boy, that had been in trouble in early Pentecost. Because I don't know if you all know this, that they didn't wear neckties <laughs> back during Azusa Street. As a matter of fact, preachers, Pentecostal preachers would get up and say, I'd rather have a snake tied around my neck than wear that worldly thing. <laughs> a necktie was considered worldly. Now, if you don't have one on, you're considered worldly. It's just a matter of what, what place and time you are. All right. But Paul says, I'm not sufficient of and by myself, because he's, you know, he, he said, my sufficiency, my, my self-sufficiency is in Christ's sufficiency. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, he says, uh, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Ex what he's saying is that the external people, things, materialism, circumstances, do not produce joy, strength, and satisfaction with life. Amen. Oh, if I would just, if I just had, you know, million dollars, it'd be gone next week. Hello. Because a lot of people, if they, when they hit the lottery, they don't go, well, I'm going to put this money in the bank. I'm going to be wise with it. They go, okay, I'm living like this right now. I'm going out every night and I'm eating Wendy's. Okay. Okay, don't have any money because I'm going out every night and meeting Wendy's at dinner. I'm eating Chick-fil-A for breakfast. Um, I'm eating, you know, Burger King for lunch. But you get the, get the million dollars. Now you're going to first watch for breakfast every morning. You're going to um, the city club for lunch. That used to be downtown and on the, up there in, in Greensboro on the high on the top of the uh, Jefferson Pilot building, had the city club up there. And I'm going to Ruth Chris every night. What did they do? They elevate their lifestyle to match the money. They went from a beat up, rusted out, termite infested car. <laughs> Hello. To a Lamborghini. Because that, be, because they don't know the secret of satisfaction. 
And what we as a church need to do, I, I remember something that, um, oh gosh, he teaches on finances. I'm trying to think of his name. Thank you, Gordon Ramsay. He, I read something he said years ago. He said, set your maximum lifestyle and give the rest to God. Okay. Just because you got $10 million doesn't need, you mean that you need a $5 million house. You don't want to have to clean that thing anyway. Amen. Hello? I remember when, uh, when somebody was, was at the church, he, he had started his own business doing sound stuff, and he was doing the home for a, a wealthy businessman in Greensboro. Took me over there one day. 12,000 square feet. It was well over a million-dollar house. Had a, you drove up to the house and drove into the driveway and drove through a gate and drove under a catwalk. Well, the catwalk was connected to the garage with a staircase down into the garage. You could pull into the garage, close the door, walk up the steps, and when you walked up and started across there, there was a bonus room over top of the garage. There was a catwalk to the house enclosed with TV monitors all down there that kept up with the games or whatever that you would play in the pool room that's over the garage and in the, in the next room that you, when you got first into the house there was some other kind of uh, room there that was you know entertainment stuff and they had these t and there was a there was a mechanical it was a, it was an electronics closet they had racks of, I mean air control controlled environment air conditioning and heat closet big <laughs> half the size of this room with racks of DVD players and VHS players and, you know, uh, music and all this stuff that was all connected to touch pads in every room. Cool stuff. And there's nothing wrong with having things. But if every time you get to a place, you've got to have more, then there's something wrong because it's the i got to have more that demonstrates a lack of contentment. There's nothing wrong with heaven. I mean, if you're living, if you're living in a house that you know, is being held up by tobacco sticks, it'd probably be a good idea to get a better one. Okay? But you know, you know, I, if I just got to that house, I'd be happy. And what happens when you get into it? I'm not happy. I can tell you a home, a house will not make you happy. Homes make you happy, but houses don't. Okay? And so um, the dilemma for Christians, many are dissatisfied because of what others have said, because preachers, what they say, unanswered prayer, failures, what you seem as failures, and shortcomings. And they, half these things happen, our, 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 our perspective is skewed if we're not careful. You go to the prosperity seminar. There's going to be a thousand-fold anointing tonight. When God was saying that, we didn't have we didn't have hundredfold. We had thousandfold. Yeah, where did he get it from? Just made it up. I got a thousand-fold anointing up here. Got to give him this offering to get in on it. Yeah. Hello. And people running up giving money because you know they want that thousand-fold return on that money. What does he do? Mr. Snake Oil runs out of town with all the money. You got nothing. Every once in a while, somebody, you know, uh, something happens for somebody, and they, well, that becomes the testimony of all testimonies. That will be played from here until Jesus comes back. They'll be showing reruns on the way up. Okay? This happens because believers depend upon the external to satisfy an internal need. And this internal need can only come from being with God. Yes. Now listen, I'm not trying to go from one ditch to the other. I'm not trying to run back over to the old Pentecostal hard shell Baptist stuff. Okay. They're a lot alike in a lot of ways. It's one that speaks to tongue, one don't. Okay. You know, Lord, you keep them humble. And we'll, I mean, we you will keep them humble. And you keep them poor. No, you keep them humble. We'll keep them poor. Yeah, they're gonna keep you poor. Now we're not trying to. Now we're not saying that. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. 
But I can tell you that there's a lot of things in the kingdom of God we have emphasized on the external and not enough on the internal. And it misleads people. There is such a need to satisfy the heart before the flesh. Okay? And when you can handle money right and be like Paul, I've learned to abound. Now, I, I, <clears throat> I read a translation one, or a commentary of a translation one time, and I, I've never been able to find it again. I put it in some notes and it got whatever, and I can't find it. I just don't know where I... But, I, but it, it made an impression on me that I remember what it said, even all these years later. I just can't go find it. It aggravates me because I think, where is that? You know? But Paul said there in, in, in an alternate translation, he said, um, I have learned to abound and not lose my head. I've learned how to be abased and not lose my poise. In all these things, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, kind of carries on that same thought. But abound and not lose his head. In other words, not go crazy. But also be in the situation where you are abased and not lose your poise. You maintain what? You're the same whether you got too much or not enough. That's what faith does. Faith is not shaken. Why? Because the person of faith knows their God. They know their God. Right. Amen. Yeah. I said they know their God. We, we shout and run and go crazy over we're going to get rich. I wish we would shout and run and go crazy as it were over coming into his presence. Being with God. See? We get so excited about what he does for us way more than what he is in us. Now, again, I'm not trying to go back into the ditch. Sometimes you overemphasize stuff to, you know, to get people out of stupid stuff, you know, they living over here on, you know, Grumble Alley let right next down to, you know, Poverty, you know, Poverty Avenue. You know, hello. Barely get along street right next to uh, Grumble Alley. There you go. Yeah, barely get along, you know. No, it is a matter of the internal. And Paul said, when I face this, I can do it through Christ. I can keep my head and not lose my senses when I got too much. What do you mean lose your senses? Well, you ain't going to see me in church the next six years. I'm on a worldwide, round-the-world cruise with every port of call on the planet. My bucket list, I'm starting at 25. God doesn't want you to have prosperity, so all you do is your bucket list. How about funding the kingdom? How about supporting this? How about being, you? listen, and not just using your money to pay somebody else to do your job. Well, what's my job? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Y'all acting like the first church of the frozen chosen right now. Now, this is not to be condemning. It is to arrest us and make us think. Where is my satisfaction? Where is my contentment? Am I truly going to be content if I have my dream car, my dream house, my dream retirement with my dream spouse? Because if you're thinking like that, you might trade one in <laughs> for the newer model. Don't you be, don't, don't you be window shopping. Hello? It don't hurt. Yeah, it does hurt to look. Like that movie, The Preacher's Wife with Whitney Houston, remake of The Bishop's Wife, okay, with Cary Grant. Whitney Houston did a remake called The Preacher's Wife, you know, and her mama's talking to her, yeah, when I see a married woman, look at a man like that. Now, mama, it don't hurt to do some uh, window shopping. She said, as long as you don't put nothing on layaway. 
<laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. <coughs> That's one of my favorite lines in that movie. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. As long as we ain't putting nothing on the layaway. <laughs> Glory to God. Um, and you think, I'm going to be happy if I have all this. But will you really? And I can tell you, no. No. Where will I find contentment? Where is it going to be? You know, um, when we depend upon these external things, hurt comes, dis disappointment comes, dissatisfaction comes. And then we try other things to fill the void that really only the internal satisfaction and contentment can create or fill. Okay. Um, Paul, Paul said this. Um, he said in Colossians 3, 2, set your affections, Colossians 3, 2, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. He went on in Philippians 4, 13 and, and stated again, I can do all things with, uh, through Christ who strengthens me. Let me say this. Are you ready for this one? Because see, in our charismatic word of faith circles, we, we, we judge people. Oh, yeah. We call it discerning. It's nothing but the gift of judgment, which is not one of the spiritual gifts that comes from God. That's one of them Diablo gifts. Okay? Lack doesn't bring defeat. Abundance doesn't bring victory. I got Two grunts, four stairs, and I think I heard in somebody's head, help me, Jesus. Okay? Lack doesn't bring defeat, and abundance doesn't bring victory. I can prove to you that abundance doesn't bring victory. We got people out there in the world right now who are multimillionaires, even billionaires. They have no joy in their life. They have nothing but calamity. They have nothing but destruction. They have nothing but misery. If you want to go look at the Kennedys, with all that money, <clears throat> that family has had nothing but a curse on it for almost 100 years. Death, 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 destruction. But they had all the money anybody could ever want. They had the private planes. They had the Martha's Vineyard, the house at Martha's Vineyard, or the estate, not a house, the estate. Okay? all tied up in, in a tax-sheltered estate where well, they just went and lived on it. And they, you know, they didn't really own it, but they, you know, it, they did, but they didn't. You know, it's, it was the way it would work. It was the way it was set up. D there was no joy there. They still die. They still get killed. And then you can go find some somebody, I mean, you got... Don't have anything hardly. They got a roof over the head. They got a car that'll get them from A to B. And they're just as happy in the Lord. And what's the difference? Learning that the exterior is not governing the interior. Now, I'm not saying you can't have the other, uh, having being blessed or, because <clears throat> we're going to have to teach on prosperity sometime and I'm going to have to teach on it. You know, God wants you to prosper. But I believe if we can get the heart right and then teach on prosperity, it's more effective. Because we can handle it properly. But the Bible says that we are stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards. We're to be a good steward. I said we're to be a good steward. Not a frivolous steward. Y'all here, you're going home. Who's here? Raise your hand if you're here. Most of y'all are here. Okay, a couple of you aren't. All right. So lack doesn't bring defeat and abundance doesn't bring victory. Hello? Now, lack can be a sign of defeat, but it doesn't bring defeat. Abundance can be a sign of victory. Can be. Not necessarily. That's why I said can. Because either one of these things, you know, you could look at it and go, well, you know, if he's abundant, he's got a lot of stuff, he's got to have victory. No, not necessarily. 
But in the life of the believer, you know, walking with God, satisfied with God, you can have abundance, and that be a outgrowth of that internal contentment. And lack can be an outgrowth of an internal discontentment. But I'm not necessarily. That's why I wanted, that's why I wanted to clarify that. That's not a, that's not a hard set whatever. <clears throat> you can't look at anybody and go, well, they got too much, or they got a bunch of stuff, they can't be happy. Or you look at somebody don't have enough, and you go, well, they, got, they must be miserable. Not necessarily. Okay? This, that's why we're trying. We're trying to get you outside of the, the thinking of the external and come to the internal because internal satisfaction will affect the external. Okay? Um, when we look at Paul, now let's, let's think about it. Now we're going to kind of flip over there. We're not going to read all of it because it's too much. You read it, okay? Y'all hear me? I didn't hear anybody say okay. All right. 2 Corinthians chapters 11 and 12. <coughs> now, Paul, um, if you go back in chapter 10, you'll see why he picks up and starts on, on the line that he picks up here. Okay? And he's talking about people. Um, they're, they're basically mocking Paul saying that they have more status than him, that they have more authority, they have more whatever. And then, you know, he says in verse 10, chapter 8, uh, verse 18, for not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. <clears throat> in other words, they were self-proclaimers of their status in the kingdom. You know, and, and Paul goes, now I went to God, verse 1 of 11, you could bear with me a little in my folly. I mean, uh, and indeed, bear with me. All right, Paul, we're going to bear with you. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, the serpent as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, <laughs> Paul was the most, most learned educated of all the apostles he was a freeborn roman studied the feet i believe gamayo super intelligent doctor of the law basically i mean in today's terms he would have his phd all right um <clears throat> but he was he wasn't eloquent in garbage verbiage You know, people, you know, people who say all the things and the whole time either don't know what they're talking about or they're, they got an ulterior statement behind it. All right. All right. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, we, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense and abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supply. In other words, here in Corneth, <coughs> they're giving him a hard time and they're saying, you know, probably saying he's a money grubbing dog and all this kind of stuff. And he said, look, I didn't take anything from you guys. The other churches had to come and supply so I could minister to you. I wouldn't be chargeable to you. I would not give you an accusation against me because I want to, hello, I want to help you. And, um, and in all things, I kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth is in Christ, uh, is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. <coughs> For such are false apostles, 
deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, boy, I'm telling you, wow. We just love everybody. I mean, they get on television and they say some of the stupidest stuff I've ever heard. But we can't say anything bad. We just got to love on them. <laughs> that ain't what Paul was doing. He said they're ministers of Satan. Mm -hmm. Everybody say, wow. wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Yeah. Wow. God, Satan transforms himself into what? An angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. In other words, they're going to get judged for being what they are. I say again, let no man take me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. See, they kept talking about how you know, all this stuff. They were teaching stuff and causing disruption with, with bad teaching in the church. And people gravitate. Listen, we got people out there right now. They're on television, and because they wear skinny jeans and have bad head and wear tunic tops, and they, they look really cool with all their electronic stuff up there on the platform, people listen to them because they're marketed really cool. And they didn't listen to them with their heart. And those people are feeding the discontentment in people's lives what for to gain from them in their own personal being wealth wealth let's say money they don't care about them people it's about how how, how much can i get out of it hello and they're feeding on that discontentment and pulling it out of people and they're running, and people run to it because they've been so trained to think external. We don't teach enough in our circles. The Word of Faith, Charismatic, Pentecostal circles. Well, Pentecostals, they, they were, we can't have anything. They were, they were in the other ditch. I, know, I grew up Pentecostal, came up among the Word of Faith. Okay? But they've been trained so much to e examine everything by the external that we, they went too far over there. And now you got people who are emissaries of Satan using that against them. Now, I know this is not popular. I'm sure we got 400,000 people watching right now on the internet. Not. Should be, but we don't. I think we got a couple out there. <laughs> I see Ellie's watching while she's here in person. Dick is watching him. He's in here in person. Daniel's out there in the ether world. And we got two, we got, okay, we got two. Thank y'all. Okay. Now, some of the people watch it later. I get that. Okay. Um, when that, Paul's, Paul's not happy with this. Okay. And so he's, he's saying, okay, you guys have, have tried to use your external credentials. I'll use mine. Okay. That's what you're going to do. That's the game you're going to play. I can play it too. I got a bigger bat. I can hit it further. Okay? Um, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. <laughs> he was so <laughs> rhetorical. <laughs> he was a smart butt. <laughs> I don't know what else to call him. <laughs> okay? Hallelujah. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Think about that. And they're right on following them. Ab uh, abused, refused. Hello? I speak as concerning reproach as though we had weak, been weak. Howbeit, when, when and soever we, any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. They're bold, I'm bold. Are they Hebrews? Well, so am I. Are they Israelites? <laughs> so am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? Well, so am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. 
and labors more abundant, and stripes more above measure, and prisons more often, and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I was shipwrecked. Um, a, night, a night and a day I've spent in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, and fastings often, and cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. Who is weak and I'm not offended? Who is offended and I'm not, I mean, who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is offended and I'm not, I'm not, I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Artis, the king kept the city of the, the, the Massacenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. They locked the city down trying to get him. And through a window in a basket, I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Verse, uh, uh, chapter 12. It is not expedient for me to doubtless to glory, because I'll come to visions and dreams, of revelations of the Lord. <laughs> in other words, hey, I've done it, but hey, I'm going to one-up you now, guys. I had visions and revelations. Hello? I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was called up into the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to be uttered. Now, most theologians historically believe this is when Paul was stoned and left for dead. He went into the third heaven and heard things unlawful to be uttered. What? He saw the new creation. He saw righteous men and women spirits. He saw what Jesus had done in his death, burial, and resurrection, and he couldn't utter it. It took him the rest of his life to write it, to bring that revelation out in, in his epistles of who we are in Christ. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory but in my infirmities. For though I would desire the glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now Satan came. Now Jesus, you're going to experience the enemy coming against your life. Anybody that teaches otherwise is stupid. Yes. Yes. Stupid. Turn them off. There is no such thing as a non-challenged Christian life on this earth. Well, I don't believe that. I believe that I received no attacks in Jesus' name. Go ahead, stupid. Let me know how that works out for you in five years. Okay? You can't confess away that which is going to happen. What do you do? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, remain on the battlefield ready to do battle again. Hello? Fight the good fight of faith. Amen? you gotta be you got to be prepared for battle. Amen. Hello. Not tiptoe through the tulips, by the window with me. Oh, Miss Vicky, this is for Miss Vicky. Tiptoe through the tulips with me. If you don't remember that song, you're blessed. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. And <coughs> there was a season that every television program that was a open format where they, they brought guests on and stuff had Tiny Tim. And Tiny Tim only ever sang Tiptoe Through the Tulips on his ukulele for Miss Vicky. That's not life. That's not reality, folks. Hello. 
There are giants in the land. Amen. And if you think, Brother Hagin used to say it this way, if you think you're going through life on flowery beds of ease, you're, you know, you're, you're in trouble. <coughs> we're not going through life on flowery beds of ease. That we were just picking the blessings of life off of the trees like ripe cherries. There's battles to be won. There's, there's lands to be conquered. There's forces to abate. Hello? Take unto you the shield of faith that you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. They're coming. You got to be prepared. Amen. And they're, listen, they're not all sickness and disease. There are mental attacks. And if you have not learned to be satisfied and content with God, hallelujah, he, he, Satan will begin to sit on your shoulder. There's something wrong with you. Why? Because if you were really in faith, I, I'll guarantee you, if I went to everyone and interviewed you privately and say, have you ever had a time in your life where you heard these words, if you were really in faith, da-da-da-da-da. That's not God. That's the devil trying to use your dissatisfaction and discontentment against you. And then if you don't work whispering it in your ear, he'll send people to tell you. Well, I'll just tell you one thing, brother. If you were really in faith, you'd have had your own building by now. Thank you. Don't ever show up here again. I got enough trouble with the devil without you adding to it. <coughs> Hello. I was talking to um, uh, the former, he, he was the original district director for North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And um, in Florida back then, it was actually Florida too. And he called me, he said, he said I, I've missed you, Ed. This is the son, I've missed you. You know, he, he just, he, got a, such a, he has such a good heart. And uh, we spent about an hour talking. <coughs> And I was talking about the building and stuff, and he, he didn't know about the building. We got in our own building and all that, and I, I shared everything that happened. And um, I said, Pastor, had I listened to the people who told me if I, if, I, if I were where you are, I'd leave and go somewhere else to find people who loved me and appreciated me. You know, I got that from more than one person. Basically, you know, um, it was either the people didn't love you, you got a right to leave, or... You know, something's wrong with you. And then we have people leave the church with that, that kind of sentiment. You know, if he was really a good pastor and really a good leader, he, he wouldn't be in the business park or out of the business park or what, all the stuff. Hello. <coughs> he wouldn't be in that, that situation. What does the business park, not in the business park, in the real, what has that got to do with if I'm obeying God or not? That's your opinion. Hello? And a snotty one at that. We used to call it snot nosed opinions. Hello? Are you all here? You're going home. Now, listen, I don't need you. The devil's already been on my shoulder already. If you were really, if you really heard from God, you would be further down the road than you are. You can't judge things that way. You can't judge them the way the world judges them. You can't view them the way the world views them. You've got to come to a place of contentment and satisfaction in God that you walk with God. Use your faith. Obey Him. Put your faith in the things He's putting in your heart to do and keep doing it. Whether you're seeing the, well, I graduated from Rhema last week and I got 4,000 people in my church next month. Mm-hmm. Hello. You know, here you're going home. Why aren't you doing anything? <laughs> you know, I can't talk to you. You're not, you're a PR. Somebody. You ain't nothing. If you've got 4,000 people that quick, there was something else going on before you ever showed up. I can guarantee you that. Hello. 
mean, I've been in circles where people start talking, and they start talking about how big their churches are. And if you talk and you don't tell them, you know, you don't have one like them, it's, it's kind of like you got the plague. You know, they're all, I'm John G. Lake, and the bubonic plague is dying. Am I? It's dying right now with you standing here. Are you trying to kill me? I said, oh, where was I? I'm still, I'm still in chapter 12, aren't I? Okay. The messenger of Satan came and says, Is this thing I thought besought the Lord three times thrice, that it might depart from me. He said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, don't misinterpret that in the old Pentecostal way. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather in glory in my infirmities. Infirmities does not reflect sicknesses. More so weaknesses. We can face struggles, weaknesses, infirmities. Okay? It could include sicknesses, but you know, most people go, automatically go, Paul was sick. He was the sickest of all men. He had ophthalmalia, uh, oriental pussy eye disease with this discharge running down his face. It was so bad, he wrote and said, you see how large letters I write because he couldn't see. Can you imagine the number of tablets it would take to carry a letter around? They had to get a mule and a cart for each and have a trailer full of each letter, not the whole letter, and each Greek letter on one tablet because he wrote it so big because he couldn't see. And they'd have to lay them out in the right order. It had to be numbered, okay? Alpha, Theta, you know, Omega. <laughs> <laughs> going on down, Kappa. Lay them out, and everybody gets to have to go up on top of the roof so they can read it because it's so big they can't read it close up. <laughs> I'm being foolish, aren't I? I'm acting like Paul. He's my mentor. All right. Um, I will grab a glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures and infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Let's well, stop there. We don't need to read. We can, we can stop there. Paul said, I'm not rejoicing in the fact that I am sick or I am weak. I'm glorying in those things because I know this. When I have reached the end of me, he takes over. Amen. Amen. That's why he th said things like, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What shall separate us from the love of God? Angels and you know, all the stuff he lists. And he says, uh, I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Amen. Amen. He learned the secret to being abased or abounding and being able to come out of that still walking level with God. He wasn't up and down. He wasn't this week in the sermon, got supernatural debt cancellation. We're going to run up there and throw all the money we got in Pastor Ed's pockets. I'll throw it on the platform for him to gather up and walk out with a bag of money, tax free. Uh, because nobody got a count of that. <laughs> Hello. Amen. And then he didn't have anything. You come back in next week and you are Eeyore of the church. Okay. You're Tigger one week and Eeyore the next. Never make Winnie the Pooh or Piggly. It's always Eeyore or, or Tigger. One or the other. And you look, you look like the... Uh, Seismic meter for an upcoming earthquake. <laughs> That's your life. Are you here? You're going home. See, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy. He did write in 1 Timothy, chapter 6. I need to get out of Thessalonians, though. It would be help me. It really would help me if I got out of Thessalonians. In verse 12 said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life, 
Whereunto thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Amen. That's why I went too far. Back up to verse 6. I went, I went slain to 12. Well, I was supposed to stop at 12, not start. That, I just read it was good, though. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content, independent of the circumstances. But they that, listen, they that will be rich. Now stop. Okay? Don't get hung up on this. All right? But they that will be rich, when you're all you can think about. And this is where we got off in the, in the, in the uh, prosperity teaching. People just got caught up with having all this stuff. They were not sitting there thinking, I can build orphanages. I can support missionaries. I can put a new wing on the church to have more people. I can pay for advertising. Now, you might get them to say that, but that ain't what they're thinking. They're thinking Royal Caribbean, lifetime member, top deck suite, private balcony. Hello. We're taking off, and we'll see you next year. We might fly back in for an anniversary service or something. Hello? They're not thinking the other things. Y'all hear you going home. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money... Is the root of all evil. Now, really, the Greek says this. The love of money is a root of all evil, of all kinds of evil. Okay? Now, I've seen stuff that happened that had nothing to do with money. Guy comes in the house, catches his wife in the bed with another man, pulls that gun, blows his head off, or the guy's head off or whatever. It had nothing to do with money. Okay? So, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You can't trace everything back to money. So, the King James here, you know, how they did it, how they structured it, left it a little wanting. And we've preached that, you know, everything's about money. No, no, it's not. Hello. But it is a root of all kinds of evil. And what he said here, they that will be rich. He's talking to those who've set their affections on finances and money. And they're pursuing money. And they're coming to prosperity seminars to, figure, to, to learn this gig on how to get rich. Hello. Instead of getting rich in their heart, they want to get rich in the natural. Um, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which while some covet it after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Wow. Hello? Now, that don't mean you get rid of all your money and be poor. We have too much, there's too much Bible to show God blesses his people. But it's this, where's your heart? Because you're setting your heart on all this money. Amen. You, you, you better read this. You better watch your heart. Amen. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. <coughs> and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Amen? Uh, Hebrews 13, 5. I'm rapping. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on, guys. That, that was funnier than what you're acting. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 5 says, 4, 13 ain't going to cut it, is it? Y'all probably already there reading it. I hadn't even gotten there. Okay. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he that said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man will do unto me. Now stop. Be content with what such things as you have. In other words, don't, what, what does it say? Paul says, I've learned therein to be content. 20th century New Testament. To be independent of the circumstances. 
With what you have, be independent of the circumstances. Don't keep looking at what you have and going, I would only be happy if, if. I could only be happy if. if I, don't do that. Be independent of the circumstance where you are right now. Hello. This is what Paul's saying. Philippians 3. We, we've already been there. We'll finish up there. How about that? You don't mind if we finish up there? I mean, I got more scriptures I can read, but we can, we can probably wrap here. Um, okay. Philippians. Anybody know how to keep Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians straight? The General Electric Power Company. There you go. <laughs> 413, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Hallelujah. Paul learned to be content because Christ is his strength. Amen. And church, I, listen, we, I, this is not some kind of, you know, anti-word of faith, anti-charismatic, anti-prosperity teaching. It is get your heart right teaching. Because you will never fully be able to handle, enjoy, and properly use prosperity and abundance if you don't learn this secret. Because you will not be able to have enough. It's kind of like the veggie tales on with Madame Blueberry. Madame Blueberry was not happy. She had to keep getting more blueberries and all this stuff. She had to keep collecting, keep collecting, keep collecting. Could never, never be satisfied. Hello. And I know we got children's tales, you know, that are not Christian necessarily along those lines. You know, you're just not, never happy. Got to have more. Got to have more. Got to have more. Got to have more. When you got to have more, you'll never get enough. It's impossible to reach the saturation stage of happiness by getting more. You have to reach that happiness and that joy and that internal commitment before you ever get there. Then you can handle it. And then you'll be like, well, you know what? I really don't need $200 million. I know missionaries who could, who could use, you know, a half million dollars to set their ministries up for the next 30 years on the, on the mission field, you know? You know, their work was going. A lot of missionaries, when they go in, to, go in these countries, can't earn money there. They're not allowed to. They have to be fully funded to even come into the country. Hello. And you're concerned about your Lamborghini. And they're out there trying to win people to Jesus. So, yeah, God may want you to be prosperous. But what are we going to do? If we can find contentment and be happy without having to have the excess, then we can funnel money into the kingdom. Then you know there's enough money out there to build a new building out here right now, right now and pay for it debt-free. Pay the parking lot, put a lighted sign up, advertise billboards all over town. That, that money's sitting out there right now. In the hand of Christians. Hello. Who could have just gotten the Porsche instead of a Lamborghini? You understand? You understand? I'm, not, I'm not knocking it in the sense of just knocking it. I'm saying, where are our priorities in that point where how, how nice does it have to be? How much do I have to have for me personally? Before I realized that just getting the nicer, the nicer, the nicer, and the higher, the more expensive, whatever. <clears throat> it's like it's like that one of these movies that where the guy he's really rich and um, he he does something that the, the company didn't like, and so he tells the girl he's going to marry that. Um, well, I'm no longer rich. Not that I'm poor. We're just going to have to share a helicopter instead of having our own. Hello. Or you go share a helicopter now instead of having your own helicopter. Wow. We're flying coach. Get, I can't. I, I'll never forget, but I was on Lufthansa flying um, uh, from, in German, from New Germany. I think I flew into Munich. Flying from Munich to Prague, Czech Republic. 
and the Germans are obnoxious about flying. They all have their game. They get a newspaper, they sit down in the seat, and as soon as, it, as it's the right time, they all throw the arms back, get the paper up, they're over in your seat on both sides, and you're sitting there like this. So what do you do? You wait for them to turn the page, and you get an arm down. You lock in. I got this one. Turn your page, buddy. Turn. I got it. <laughs> if I'm stuck in the middle, y'all going to have to hang out, lean against the window, hang out now. I've got this position now. And then you're, you're, you're in non smoky The row behind you started smoking because they're smoky. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you could have thought, well, that's the glory cloud. No, it smelled like tobacco. <laughs> glory to God. Let's find our contentment in Christ. Let's find that internal contentment and then move forward. God can bless you, and God will bless you, and God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have, he wants you to have prosperity. He wants you to have good things. But let's not take that to that excess that we just keep getting more and more and more and more and more and more, and we leave our first charge out, and that is to reach the nations. Amen? And I love Brother Summerall. Brother Summerall came to the church I was in uh, before we came here, Greensboro, and uh, he just let, let you know he came for your money. Because he had evangeline the uh, cargo ship, huge cargo ship. He had, he had the, air, the, uh, the uh, C-130 cargo airplane. And he was buying all that So because God told him to feed the hungry. He was taking food all over the world. <coughs> cargo ships full. So he just let you know. And he wasn't doing it for him. He wasn't doing it for Brother Summerall. <coughs> he was doing that to do what God had for him to do in feeding the hungry. Hello, God gave him that mission. He was doing it. And I've come for your money. And here's what we're doing. And it wasn't so he could drive a Lamborghini. You know, I, I get frustrated with preachers who do this excessive stuff and then brag about it and then go into churches. And, and what they do is they get into all the churches who want to get rich. And they preach those messages and everybody just throws money out the window like crazy. Hello. And you think, you know what? I get it. You, you, can have, you can have what you want. But you know, you could have bought a Porsche. And there's a church over here that if you gave them the difference, you would take financial pressure off that ministry in such a way that they could do all kinds of things they weren't able to do before. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to go over here to, you know, you could have sold the perfume for 300 pence and given it to the poor. I'm not trying not to go there. Okay. There's a balance in this. There really is a balance in what I'm talking about. You know, we don't want to get over here where, you know, you can't have anything. And we don't want to get over here where, you know, you can have everything. Somewhere in there, there's a balance to this that our hearts are right. We're independent of the circumstances. We're doing God's will. And as God has need and God wants to, and we see need, we're, we're ministering to that at the best we can. And God honors it. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Let's take up the offering and go home. Oh, you're going to save money? Yes, I am. Tithing is biblical. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you you're going to die and go to hell if you don't tithe tonight. Hello? All right. Hallelujah. If you need an offering envelope, they're on seat back in front of you. You're going to electronically. Go ahead and ring that up. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Father, we bless the people as they tithe and give according to your holy word. And thank you they're blessed according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you for giving. Thank you for sending in electronically. And thank you for joining us tonight. Hallelujah. Those of you who joined us tonight by the internet, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that this, uh, who's, whatsoever, whatsoever, who whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Good night. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad.